You guys have a good week this week? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Don't you wish it would don't you wish it would rain? Me and the frogs. <laughs> Need to save some for August now. Oh yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for each and every person that come to your house, Lord, today to hear your word and I ask you, Lord, just to uh allow your word to be spoken today. Allow, just lead us and guide us and allow us to know your will, Lord, for our lives. We thank you for your book, the Bible, the Word, everything in it. We believe it's true, Lord, and uh, we thank you, Lord, for just keeping your hand on us, watching over us at all times. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I title this sermon as a question. Why does the world hate us as Christians? Do you know why the world hates us as Christians? That's the question. I ran across this video, and uh, this guy gives us an aspect of why the world hates us as Christians. And he actually tells a story that comes out of the Bible, out of the book of Acts, chapter 19 beginning at verse 21. And he tells it a little bit different than my Bible tells me. But the point is the, the way they view it, the way the, the world views us as Christians. So I'm going to read the story. My Bible uses the goddess Diana in this. And he names another God. But I want you to understand that the people of the world back then had many gods and many goddesses that they worshipped. It's the Apostle Paul. It says, uh, verse 21, When these things were accomplished, Paul proposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia, and whatever that word is, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who were ministering to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself self stayed in Asia for a time. And about the time there rose a great commotion about the way. Christians were called people of the way in this time. What's Jesus say is, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of the similar... Of, of similar occupations and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So, not only is this trait of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be, may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all of Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were filled with wrath and cried out, saying, Great is the goddess Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and, I, I can't, yeah. These were, tra these were Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go in, go in to and when Paul wanted to go into the, the people and the disciples would not allow him. 
when some of the officials of Asia who were with or who were his friends sent him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried out one thing and some cried out another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hands and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out, for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Okay, Artemis. That, that's the name he uses, is Artemis in this video. But I wanted to read you the story from the Bible before I played this video. And I can't play it on the screen. I'm just going to let you hear the, the, the voice of it. Where did the sound come out? Huh? Hey, Paul, Apollos, Timothy, Priscilla, and all the other followers of Jesus, equally. If you're a follower of Jesus, I hate you too. You destroyed my job, my family, and my city. The good news of Jesus Christ being the Messiah was not good news for everyone. Christianity disrupted lives and communities throughout the entire Roman Empire. Your world is upside down. And it's been that way for so long that you probably have no ability to see the world in any other way than how you see it. However, I will explain my reality to you, and you will understand Christianity in a whole new way. And you'll understand why I hate the Apostle Paul. Thousands of years ago, in a faraway cave in a deep forest, a hunter leaves his cave to hunt for a small deer. He's desperate for food, desperate to feed his starving family. On the way out of the cave, he stumbles, and he reaches for a rock to steady himself. That day, in a short period of time, he finds a deer, kills it with ease. That night, he feeds his family. And he stares at the rock, and he remembers how he touched it before his unusually successful hunt. A few days later, Hunter goes out to hunt again, and furtively touches the rock on the way out of the cave. But he wants to keep it on the down low. And once again, he has unusually quick success in his hunt. Suspicion confirmed, if he touches the rock before hunting, he's more likely to prosper. That night, he tells his wife, convinces her to touch the rock in the hopes that she will become pregnant sooner. She touches the rock and becomes pregnant soon thereafter. Now, there's no doubt, touching the rock improves your chance of becoming prosperous. Future generations of the family touch the rock when they want to be prosperous and even begin sacrificing to the rock to become more prosperous. As this family becomes prosperous, other families in their tribe find their own rocks or trees to sacrifice to, to worship. Idol worship appears to cause prosperity in some cases. People would obviously be foolish not to have their own family idols to worship. There was seemingly only an upside, with no downside to worshiping a family idol. Over the course of time, people chose to worship every kind of inanimate object ancestor, animal, or part of nature. People have always been desperate to be protected and prosperous. I'm willing to do anything to help make that happen. As you can imagine, it was only a small step for gods to become important to cities or countries. In addition to families having their own gods, cities and countries began to have their own gods too. Obviously, you want your own country to have the most powerful gods so that your country will prevail over other countries. If your country's ever beaten in battle, you just switch to the winning gods. The Bible has an example of national gods in the story of the Philistines defeating the Israelites and taking the Ark of the Covenant from them. At first, the Philistines were terrified of the Ark of the Covenant because it held a powerful God. But then they rejoiced when they captured the Ark and took control of the God inside. This was a sign that the Philistine gods were more powerful than the God of the Jews. 
they misunderstood, which was more powerful. And after a sufficient amount of suffering, they sent the Ark back to the Jews. Hundreds of years later on Mount Carmel, the prophet Elijah pitted the God of the Israelites against the foreign gods of Queen Jezebel and King Ahab. When the God of the Israelites won the contest, the people of Israel slaughtered the prophets of the foreign gods. They had no use for loser gods. Much of the Old Testament has to do with the worship of idols versus the worship of God. The first of the Ten Commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. That commandment set the stage for the overall theme of the Old Testament. God commanded the Israelites to worship only him. The Israelites refused to do so consistently. The Old Testament stories ended about 400 years before my time. In that 400 years, the Roman Empire came into being and controlled the whole Western world. Here's what was obvious to the whole world. The Romans were the most prosperous people. Therefore, their gods must be the most powerful gods. Excluding the tiny people group known as the Jews, most people in the Roman Empire during my time lived with a very similar religious pattern. Each family had its own gods, often in the form of ancestor worship. Each tribe had its own gods, and each country had its own gods. The purpose of gods was to provide protection and prosperity. Sometimes you had to borrow gods or switch gods to improve your own prosperity. This was not a matter of theology or philosophy, but a very practical matter that affected everyone in your community. Blasphemy was a practical matter, not a matter of going to heaven or hell. By disrespecting a god, you were endangering the prosperity of a family, a city, or even a country. Which brings me to why I hate the Apostle Paul. My name is Demetrius, and I'm a silversmith, and I lived in the city of Ephesus in the year 56 AD. Ephesus was located in modern-day Turkey. It was one of the biggest and most prosperous cities in the entire Roman Empire. One reason Ephesus was so prosperous was that it had the giant temple of Artemis. In this temple was the misshapen meteorite that the Ephesians worshipped. It's important that you understand our logic. Ephesus was prosperous. Ephesus worshiped Artemis. Therefore, Artemis must be a powerful god. Since Artemis is a powerful god, anybody who worships Artemis will be prosperous. Since people wanted to worship Artemis, the city built an entire economy around selling little silver copies of the meteorite, having temple prostitutes, and selling sacrifices to Artemis. Since the demand for these products and services was high, the city prospered, and silversmiths, like myself, also prospered. Obviously, Artemis was a great and powerful god because we prospered. Since the whole world had a similar thought process, we could compete economically against other cities under the protection of the Roman Empire. In such a controlled and orderly way of life, what could possibly go wrong? The Apostle Paul is what? The Apostle Paul turned the world upside down. The Apostle Paul offered a new way of thinking, the most dangerous thing in the world. Instead of offering prosperity in this life, Paul offered a personal relationship with the creator of the entire universe. He offered eternal salvation. He offered one all-powerful universal God instead of homemade idols of wood or stone or metal or silver. We Ephesians could compete against the gods of other cities. But how could we compete against a God we could not see or touch or make silver copies of? Prosperity in this world could not compete with eternal life. Temple prostitutes could not compete with a personal relationship with God. Within three years after coming to Ephesus, Paul's teachings had permeated Ephesus and the entire province of Asia. The number of pilgrims coming to worship Artemis plummeted. My sales plummeted. I got together with the other idol makers of town and told them what Paul had done, how he had turned our world upside down. He was telling people that gods made by human hands were no gods at all. I told my fellow silversmiths that if this were true, 
jobs and our city and our gods have become worthless. And that threatened the well-being of my family. We had had enough of Paul and his dangerous thought processes. So we started a riot. It spread like wildfire to the rest of the city. We grabbed Paul and his companions and we headed to the giant city theater. It was complete chaos. We shouted, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two whole hours. Finally, one of the city officials took over. He urged my fellow citizens to calm down or we would be charged by the Romans with disturbing the peace. This was a very serious charge and we knew it. But that'll, that'll give you an idea. That gives you an idea of the way the world looked at the gospel. When the Apostle Paul preached this in, preached the gospel in Ephesus, they were, uh, they were worried about their income. They were worried about their lifestyle. They were worried about the things that was going to happen to them because... The God they were worshiping, that they were making idols for, of, and for, and to. These guys couldn't compete against the real God of heaven. They knew that this was a threat. And that's what he said. This is the reason why I hate the Apostle Paul. He is, he is pretending to be Demetrius in the story in the book of Acts. So my question is... Do these gods still exist today? This god Artemis of the Ephesians, the goddess Diana of the Ephesians, do they still exist today? Yeah? Yeah? Well, there's a couple of, there's a lot of things that happened on April the 8th a couple of days ago. One of them is, it happened at CERN. Are y'all familiar with CERN? It's in CERN, Switzerland, and there is a, what they call, a Hadron Collider. They have, they have, the scientists have come up with this collider. It is a loop. It's a tunnel. It's 17 miles long. It's 300, it's 300 miles underground. 300 foot underground, 17 miles long. And what this collider does is it takes particles and it sends them through this tunnel. And they collide, they're colliding atoms together. And they're trying to create matter. They're trying to figure out, these particles are moving at almost the speed of light when they, when they collide. And they call this experiment the God particle. That is the name of it, the God particle. And CERN, this company of CERN, it is in a town called Apollicum. The town and temple is, was dedicated to the God Apollyon, the God of destruction. This God is mentioned in our Bible. It's Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11 when it talks about the locusts. It says, And they, they had as king over them, now this is a small case, K, king. They had as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek, in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. He is, yeah, Revelation 9-11. Revelation 9-11. So this, this CERN is built in a town that in the time, in Roman time, it was called this, and it, the town and the temple was dedicated to the god Apollyon. And what are they doing in this town? 
They're playing God. That's what they're doing. They're trying to figure out how everything was created. They're trying to create matter. Yeah, yeah. Some people call it the big boom theory, whatever, but they're colliding these things in this collider. And uh, the owner of CERN, one of the lead guys at CERN, he said, this collider, as they create matter, may create a dimensional door into another dimension or a black hole or a portal into a different dimension when they collide these atoms together at the speed of light. He said something might come out of this door or we may send something in this door the store of a different dimension oh man I, I i question it i question it you know man has uh has a way of sticking his nose where he has no business and every time he does this it doesn't turn out good it doesn't turn out good what did god tell adam don't eat of that tree. Adam ate of that tree. How did that turn out? The fall of man. There's another time when a man tried to reach a different, a different thing that they don't see here on earth, and so they created the Tower of Babel. They were going to build a tower into heaven. And how did that turn out for us? There's division of people and, and languages, and they couldn't understand each other, and... It never turns out good for us when man sticks his nose where, it has, where he has no business. It, it almost reminds me of the atom bomb. When they, when they created the atom bomb, the creator, you know, he said, he said there's less than a 1% chance that we're going to run the entire world when we set this thing off. And the guy says, but there is a chance that we may ruin the entire world. And they, they sent it anyway, you know. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I look at some of these things and the mentality of people and it just, it just blows me away. But this CERN, this company called CERN, outside this company is that, that's located in, in, in the town that's dedicated to the god Apollyon, the destroyer, Outside of this company is a statue of the goddess Shiva. Shiva is both a he and a she, this statue is. She is the goddess of destruction and rebirth. That is what she is the goddess of. She destroys what's here and rebuilds it. Is that not a perfect definition of what Satan does? Take what, what God has made and destroy it. Kill, still kill and destroy. That, that, that's Satan. And rebuild it the way he wants it. That, that's just... That, that goddess, that statue of that goddess is outside of this company. My question is, do these gods exist today? This is two days ago. They, they lit this collider up and started colliding it on April the 8th, same day as the eclipse. On that same day, NASA sent three rockets into the atmosphere. They're going to go up there and they're going to explore and, and, and look and, you know, for knowledge and all of them things, but... That's good, but they named the mission the APEP mission, A-P-E-P. -E -P. APEP was an Egyptian god of darkness. And this god of darkness in the Egyptian story is the god of darkness that overcame Rod, the sun god. On the day that the moon covered the light of the sun, NASA launched a mission named APEP after the god of darkness that, could, that overtook Rod, the sun god. You just, and it's on the day of the eclipse. 
I mean, we look at these things and do they exist today? There's right in front of us, right in front of us. So why does the world hate us as Christians? That's the question. There are gods that are man-made gods, and there is the one true God, Yahweh, the God of the universe. There's a war going on. That is why the world hates us. There is a war between God and Satan. There is a war between the flesh and the spirit. There is a war between Yahweh, the one true God, and the man-made false gods, the idols that we see. You know, Ecclesiastes 1.9 tells us there is nothing new under the sun. All of these things that you've seen in the past, they're still here. They, they may go away and you may not see them for a while. When they come back, it doesn't mean they're new. They're still here. Another reason why the world hates us is as Christians, do you have peace that only comes from God? As a Christian, do you have peace that only comes from God? Matthew 21 tells us about that peace. Matthew 21 and verse 5. When Jesus, we, we just left Holy Week, Holy Week before Easter, the week of Easter. And Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and what did he ride in on? He rode in on the colt of a donkey. 21 verse 5. Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This donkey, do you know what it symbolized? It symbolized peace. Jesus came to bring peace. That is what this symbolized. But it came to bring peace to us. As Christians, he didn't come to bring peace to the world. That symbolism is for us, for us to know that peace of God, where that where that peace comes from. If you flip to Matthew 10, chapter 10, it tells us this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. He tells his disciples, disciples, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. You see, there is a reason why the world hates us as Christians. We have a peace inside of us that they cannot understand. They can't see it. I'm just going to start reading right here. Matthew 10, verse 16. I'm going to read this story. This is when Jesus sent the disciples out to preach the word. He said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to council and scour you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, don't worry about about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, brother, I will, I will deliver up. Now, brother, I will deliver up brother to death and, and a father to his child. And children will rise up against parents 
and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, for surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor is a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will, that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them fall to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hair, hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Be he who loves his father more Father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. Why does the world hate Christians? I mean, it, it took off right there in the very first, verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Why is the disciples of Jesus Christ in the midst of wolves? Because the people of the world do not like the things of the Spirit. They like things exactly the way they are. They are enjoying life on earth in this world exactly the way they are. They're not seeking His will. They're seeking their own will. There is a big, big difference in those two. When you begin to know and see the difference in the things of the world and the things of a Christian, you begin to see it. You begin to understand why. In this, in this passage, it tells us what we are not to do. 10.26 Well, first I'm going to go 10.22. It says, you will be hated for my name's sake. And then it goes on to 26, and it tells us what not to do in the Scripture. Therefore, do not fear them. And if you go to verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Who is the one that can kill the body and the soul? It's Jesus Christ on the day of judgment. 
but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's what that verse right there says. Verse 31. Do not fear, therefore you are more valuable than many sparrows. In this passage, the words do not fear is used three times. Three times. As Christians, as disciples, disciples are followers of Christ. We are told what not to do in this scripture. When these, the world comes against us and we feel like sheep in the midst of wolves, we are not to fear those wolves. You've got to realize that you're covered. You're covered by the blood of the Lamb. Your salvation is put in place. The wolves can kill your physical body, but they cannot take your soul. They cannot, they cannot kill you spiritually. In this passage, not only does it tell us what not to do, it also tells us what to do. If you look over here at verse 38, 1038, and he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lo- who finds his life will lose it, and him who loses his life for my sake will find it. It tells us something that we are supposed to do. We are supposed to take up our cross. Even though we're in this world and there's a battle going on and we're in the battle. I mean, the battle is already won. Jesus Christ has won the battle. The battle is already won, but yet we've still been put into this world that's full of people who hates Christians. We who endure to the end will be saved. Um, so I just kind of went over... Um, I just made a list. Why does the world hate, hate Christians? The world does not understand God's peace. That is one reason why they do not, why, why they hate Christians. We have a peace that only comes from God. They don't understand it. They can't comprehend it. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us, The world has been blinded by the God of this age. And that word God is a little g God. The world has been blinded by Satan so that they can't see what we see. They can't comprehend what we have. They can't, they don't feel that peace that comes to us only from God. This world that we live in Is a power-hungry world. Everybody's looking to overtake something else. I mean, you look at the superpowers of the world. What are they doing right now? What is Russia doing? Steady trying to conquer another person, becoming more and more powerful. And, and we're starting to see, you know, wars and rumors of wars. And, and I look at China fixing to jump on Taiwan, and I'm going, okay. You're not big enough already, you know. It's, it's a power-hungry world. It's about control. But Hebrews 11.6 talks to us about our faith. In this power-hungry world where everybody wants to, to overtake something else, there's something that we have as Christians that they can't take. And that's our God-given faith. We have faith. In God, and God gave us that faith, and no matter how big and how bad they think they are, they cannot ever take that away from us. They can't take that faith away from us, and they cannot take our reward in heaven away from us. Even if they kill us, they kill this body in the physical. Be honest with you, as I look at this book and see what's coming ahead, you'd be doing me a favor. You'd be doing me a favor. They don't like the fact that they can't see. They can't see, they can't contain, and cannot control Yahweh, 
the one true God of the universe. Just like I was telling you about CERN and NASA launching that mission, they're serving something, but it's not the God of this universe. The one thing that those gods cannot do, just like in, in the guy speaking, in the story of Elijah, Baal and Asherah, they fell. They, they failed the test. It didn't work. And the children of Israel killed them. Killed those prophets of Baal and, 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 and Asherah. And the one true God won. He has always won. He has always been right. He's always been the one true God. By faith, the world cannot take away our God-given salvation. It cannot take away our salvation that God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. I wore this shirt on purpose today. This shirt is illegal in 53 countries. 53 countries, you can't wear that cross on the front of your t-shirt because it's illegal. On the back of this shirt, it has Romans 1.16. It's the Apostle Paul. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God, the salvation of every man that believes. The world cannot take that away from us. Never, ever take that away from us. We live in a world that Satan is the little K king of the world. And he's jealous. And he's mad. And he hates us. And the people who follow every deception that Satan puts out there, they hate us because the God we serve is the God of the universe. He is the one true God. He is the great creator of all things, and they can't do anything about it. They can't do anything about it. Next week, I'm going to go into a little bit more. I'm going to talk about prophecy. I didn't want to. I talked about CERN and NASA today, and I'll probably talk to, to a, a little bit more about them next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for just giving us comprehension, giving us understanding, Lord, of your word. We thank you, Lord, for just giving us salvation, allowing us to know that you are God. You are the one who, who wins in the end. And as we are here on earth, Lord, just allow us to reflect your light. We live in a world where many Many countries have made it illegal to preach your son, Jesus Christ, in those countries. And we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be in a country that still does allow this, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom to be able to stand here in church and gather as a body in your house, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you pour out on us. We thank you, Lord, for just allowing us to be able to see the schemes and wiles of the devil Allowing us to be able to know from your word about Apollyon, the destroyer, and the gods of the ancient times, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for just allowing us to know that they're still here. They're still here. We don't really see them in this country. They really don't come out and say, hey, it's me. This is who I am. Because it's going to be hard to deceive people if they know who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your word and your spirit that leads us and guides us and allows us to know who they are before they become present. We thank you for all things. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.